wrestling at random i'm jeremy deemer and i am adam summers and you are firmly entrenched at this point as we are in season four of the podcast wrestling at random season four is here we've took all of the internet's wrestling content dumped it into the randomizer where we fire it up every single week it randomly picks a show could be a pay-per-view could be an old territory show could be a weekly tv show and that's what we get today we've got wwe smackdown we've we've done a smackdown before i can't remember what season it was but we've uh we we've done smackdowns before we've we've covered a lot of the history and things that were going on there so make sure if you haven't heard previous smackdown reviews go back into the archives they're waiting patiently for you evergreen content that you can fire up at any moment the past editions of uh, reviews of smackdown raw all the stuff we've done over four seasons now holy cow it's all in the back catalog wrestling at random.com or wherever you're listening to this podcast right now they're all there so uh this show is an episode of smackdown like i mentioned but from december 11th of 2009 definitely Steve- the latest the latest episode of smackdown or of any major wwe television show i think that we've reviewed depending on your definition of one of the last episodes of WWE's ECW being (laughs) major or not, because that was, what, 2012 or something crazy like that? Yeah, we've got, uh, uh, this is season 11, episode 50, if you're watching on Peacock. Um, They they taped the ECW show you mentioned before the SmackDown taping. So this, uh, at at this, this is where we are in in this point of, uh, ecw wwe's version uh, which explains if you remember when we did that ecw review and we talked about how like the fans were still filing in that's <laughs> why uh, because early early on in the wwe ecw run like 2006 um uh, right after that one night sand show that we just reviewed or uh, that that show right after one night sand that raw episode uh ecw is recorded after smackdown so uh, they, they, that quickly changed, though. So we start the show with a recap showing us two weeks ago, the world heavyweight champion, The Undertaker, was taking on Chris Jericho, and that match ended in a disqualification because Batista interfered, and he uh, wore out The Undertaker with a chair, and we're told this will be legal at the TLC, the Tables, Ladders, and Chairs pay-per-view because they're fighting in a chairs match. I don't know why it always <laughs> aggravated me so much. A chairs match. Like, because you would never, ever, ever hear about a, a match where chairs are legal being called a chairs match except for on the TLC pay-per-view. Like, the Tables match was a thing, and sometimes you would have a Tables match outside of this pay-per-view, you know, where you win with getting put through a table here it's not like you win by hitting someone with a chair once or three times or five times or putting them through chairs set up next to each other it's just chairs are legal whenever i hear it i'm like well why aren't there tables or ladders involved that's lame yeah it's it's one of those like uh a weapon is legal matches just that weapon yeah so in theory, there could be a disqualification in a chairs <laughs> match, which point. that bothers me too. So, yes, because yes, uh, what if you put someone through a table in a chairs match? What happens? Disqualification, uh, immediate disqualification. <laughs> immediate. If, if you if you give someone a low blow during a chairs match, if you didn't do it with a chair, that's a disqualification. <laughs> yes. If you did a low blow with a chair, now how about if you had a count out? Like you could have a count out, but what if? You wrapped a chair around each of your opponent's legs, had him on the floor, got back in the ring. Would the referee count or not? Because those chairs are legal. The chairs are legal. That's a. It, it's there's a lot Gray of areas nuance. all around here. There's nuance that that uh, WWE never explored with the chairs match. <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> no, so so much fertile ground. Uh, uh. We we jump from the two week recap to last week's recap batista beats down the undertaker again and it it made me think about batista and the undertaker um i was at wrestlemania 23 that was the uh detroit wrestlemania headlined by 
the Trump McMahon Umaga Bobby God. Lashley hair match. Um, and it had Shawn Michaels against John Cena. The heavyweight championship match was Batista and The Undertaker there. And it was, to my recollection, the first time that The Undertaker busted out a five-star match at WrestleMania. Uh, oh. He would he would start a streak of it. And so the streak was already like starting to be talked about, but it wasn't like a legendary thing because he wasn't busting out five-star matches. Uh, a lot of these early streak matches... Streak were very forgettable. I mean, totally. It, and it's this sort of this legend that like the streak was talked about for 20 years. No, the streak was a relatively late development in the actual streak. As far as people talking on it being recognized as a thing, like you said, because it was pretty late in that run of WrestleMania matches for him that they were actually memorable in any way other than entrances. Yeah. So this was the one where it's like, Oh yeah. Like, He's gonna lose this one. Batista gets the breaks the streak and wins the yeah. championship. This is a no brainer, and 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 or it was just gonna be a no, and, and you know kind of started out like that's ah, a nothing match and it's just, it, you know it's, I think the previous year I had seen uh, the Undertaker and Mark Henry in a casket match like you know just a zero and well, wasn't and, there the Undertaker against was it was it Tess and Albert or something or it Albert was, and somebody uh, at the uh, Seattle show Albert and uh, Nathan Jones Nathan yeah. Jones that's <laughs> I was right also so that show yeah that uh so like the, you know it it, it was going to be a nothing and then all of a sudden that match at WrestleMania 23 between Batista and the Undertaker turned out to be incredible like we were losing our minds at that show because it was a match that we did had no expectations for it blew us away and then, and we were buying all the near falls because we totally thought that Batista was going to win this thing. And then Undertaker wins it. And, and it was like, it was so much fun. That, and, and that started the streak. The next year, it, uh, you know, he, uh, he wrestled Edge. He wrestled Shawn Michaels twice. He, he did, you know, he had all these great matches in a row then, but that was the one that started it. So Batista and Undertaker, uh, that's what I think of when I see them feuding here. This is a, a few years after that that match here. This is 2009. And the show opens with Let It Roll by Divide the Day. Terrible theme song. I was just going to say, this is horrible. This, this theme song <laughs> here in 2009, terrible, so generic. It does not get me hyped for a wrestling show at all. We yes. then see all the pyro in the world is set off here in this building at once. Uh, as you said, this is the go-home show for TLC. And then I hear voices. And it's not Randy Orton, although I kind of was wishing it was just voices <laughs> in my head instead of the reality of the situation, which is our broadcast team for SmackDown on network broadcast television, I believe, at this point. Yes. It is play-by-play -play man Todd Grisham and oh. color commentator matt striker this team is brutal this is a brutal announced team wretched uh to be fair matt striker at the beginning of his run was a serviceable interesting color commentator yeah at he the had... very beginning of his run in yes. wwe he was dare i say even bordering on being good he but was he, he teetered on that precipice momentarily and then he fell into the grand canyon where he was residing for this episode of smackdown oh this was not a high point in the uh analyst career of matt striker he was uh this was a struggle todd grisham is a total zero uh Sorry, Todd, if you're a listener of the program, but well, a big, not... big longtime wrestling fan, Todd Grisham. I'm sure he's listening every week. Uh, no, he is the poster child for what WWE wanted their announcers to be at this point. Know nothing about wrestling, add nothing to the product, have no personality at all, look young. My my Todd Grisham scale, though the the horrible end of it is that I can't remember if it was ECW or if it was the crummy version of nxt where him and josh were fighting yeah they, they were the broadcast team and they were just arguing with each other i can't remember which show that was but it was one of those he was either an ecw 
or it was uh, an early variety show obstacle course NXT episode. Uh, I think it may have been the ECW episode because I think Matt Stryker was on the NXT show as like a host slash he color was the host, but it, yeah, it was Todd Grisham with a uh, Josh tough enough. Josh oh, god, yeah, yeah, you're fighting. right. Yeah hideous uh so this was better than that this was not that this was this better, uh, better is not a word that should be used to describe these two men on commentary this was marginally less terrible than that i Correct. think is okay is that's a better the, way the, to say it the yeah. proper way to put it what is great on this show unintentionally is the fans this evening the signs they brought it <laughs> felt like watching uh, a show from center stage in Atlanta, WCW in the late 80s, early 90s. Some of these signs, including as Batista comes out, there's a sign that just says, Bad Batista. I crumbled <laughs> into fits of laughter when I saw that. That that reminded me of the time at Spring Stampede 94 where me and my friends, we were in the first row of the balcony at the Rosemont Horizon, now the Allstate Arena, and we had a giant sign that had to stretch probably seven or eight seats uh, that we spray painted uh, in our in my friend's garage the night before, and it said "Duh Dash Stin D U H hyphen Stin" to make fun of Dustin Rhodes, nice. which I don't even know why we did because we all like Dustin, but it just we, we <laughs> thought this was funny. And we had we hung this over and it was hanging over like a lighted pre ribbon board, but like a lighted Budweiser sign. And they, they made us take our sign down because it was blocking the advertisement. But that's that's what I thought of right here. Bad Tista. Batista comes out for a promo in the ring. He's talking about uh Rey Mysterio. Uh Ray demanded a street fight with Batista. He's talking about how the fans are booing him and he doesn't care. Meanwhile, about becoming the world champion for him. There's another fan that has a sign. They cut to, as, as Batista saying everything you described, they cut to a sign. And this sign says, Benedict Batista, loser. <laughs> <laughs> These people are the greatest. I am so happy. It's also distracting from this kind of low energy Batista promo. It's fine. It's kind of actually refreshing to see a big giant guy that isn't ranting and raving, but there, there just isn't a whole lot here. It, this is one of those classic WWF opening show promos that took 15 minutes to say three minutes worth of content. The way it finished with Batista asking them to turn the lights down, put the spotlight on that him. That was great. He, to say it's not about you, the fans. It's about me in the spotlight. This, where Batista was as a character, this was a big turning point promo for him because yes. he had been a babyface coming off of breaking up with Evolution and all this stuff, and like, and so this was uh, him finding this new heel persona, and this was. Uh, uh, I thought this was a really effective promo to get because people were still cheering him when he came out. Yes, they were booing Other than him. Bad Tisa guy. <laughs> yes, they were booing him. By the end of this promo, he was able to get the crowd uh, uh, be behind this new uh, this new heel persona. It so was I also it was extremely effective. It was the connective tissue to the character that we'd see kind of shortly thereafter into his final run, where he's out there wearing the sunglasses uh, in the arena and the, the, just the the dare I say very douchebaggy clothes that he would wear and just leaned very oh, much into that it. character. It was great, and this th that's a very good point on your part. This was the very beginning of that version of Batista here. So no, good stuff. Yeah, no, I love that Batista D bag character. That is so <laughs> so fun. I hope we get some of that here from the randomizer at some point. Um, someone who we've seen from the randomizer many times. CM Punk comes out with Luke Gallows. Uh, there, this is early straight edge society group here. Um, Punk comes out with the mic. He talks about the Jeff Hardy DVD, and uh, they end up destroying. The new Jeff Hardy DVD. They try to. Punk tries to, and it will not break. So he orders Luke Gallows to start jumping up and down on it, which is effective. What was also effective is yet another sign in the crowd, which just says, you suck, Punk. <laughs> now you can go back <laughs> into, uh, you can go back, I believe it's season three, where we did 
Night of Champions from July of 2009. So just uh, six months prior to this. And uh, Punk took on uh, Jeff Hardy at that uh, at that pay-per-view. So definitely uh, check that review out that we did if you haven't already. I like how he um, calls it a digital video disc here. The DVD. <laughs> he describes it in excruciating detail. Um, this is Punk sort of at his straight edge society best. We have Matt Stryker in the first of many just lame things where he's trying to get something over, I guess, in his head as much as anything. He calls CM Punk SmackDown's Surgeon General. Our truth and Matt Hardy come out. A <laughs> natural truth. tag team if there ever was one. <laughs> Our truth is singing his song and Punk is interrupting him. So he was saying, what's up? And Punk would go straight edge. That was great. That was great. <laughs> and then he's he's yelling, do not accept those DVDs. It's poison. <laughs> As Matt Hardy's handing out DVDs at ringside. He's like, he's screaming, don't watch it. Sell it on eBay. Yeah. <laughs> Tremendous. Tremendous. I also, Fashion Corner, I have no recollection of this era of Matt Hardy in long purple trunks. Long purple tights. Yeah. I, I don't remember this. I do not remember uh, him teaming at all with R Truth. Uh, I do enjoy early on in this match, we see R Truth and Matt Hardy hit the ultimate babyface move, the friendship elbow drop, or if it was the FBI, the Paisan elbow. I always love when babyfaces, particularly when babyfaces who barely ever team together, that's the one double team move everybody knows. Each stand on opposite sides of your down opponent, clasp hands dramatically, and fall down at your elbows. Interesting note, the Punk Hardy promo on SmackDown, um, not the match, but the promo itself was edited off the show in the United Kingdom because it violated the separation of entertainment time and ad time. Oh, my because God. Because they used the it DVD. to plug the Hardy DVD. Wow. That that seems uh, quite pedantic, but oh, well. Uh, one, one commentary note I need to mention here because I had to rewind several times to make sure I heard this correctly. This is Matt Stryker at his worst, at, at his worst just saying stuff. Like, just saying stuff, throwing stuff out there, making stuff up. He said that CM Punk... And Luke Gallows remind him of the Graham brothers. What? No. I, I've uh, watched enough Florida to know that <laughs> CM Punk and Luke Gallows do not remind me of any combination of Grams. Let's talk quickly about Luke Gallows. I'm watching him on offense in this match. And my notes say no one does more movement without doing an actual move <laughs> than Luke Gallows. Everything's like a wind up or 10 steps and do this. Like everything is so elaborate to then do a move. It's exhausting to watch well, even, this iteration of Luke Gallows. <laughs> it's a great point. It's even to me, it's, it, it, it's more acutely, it's his strikes. And it's yes. so strange because like you said, there's all these machinations to then deliver like this incredibly short trajectory throat thrust. It, it, it's so strange. It's also amusing to see him here when we just saw him early earlier this season in that very, very, very short-lived one or two week gimmick as, as fake, fake game. original game. <laughs> yeah, he's he sends our truth to the corner, and it looks like he's running in mud trying to send him into the corner. So I'm just like, like oh, why is it so weird? Uh, they get the heat on our truth for for a while. Uh, he makes the hot tag to Matt. All four men are in the ring. Truth knocks Gallows out. Punk dumps our truth. We get a twist of fate by Matt Hardy onto CM Punk. But Gallows with the blind tag hits a big boot, a tree slam, which is called the 12th step. Or it's called Gallows Pole. They can't seem to decide. Uh, Stryker literally said it's both. Like and, in the uh, in the sense he said it's this or it's that. <laughs> yeah, and then he gets the pin with that move. I have other commentary notes quickly on this. First off, we're told that Dennis Miller is the guest host of Raw coming up on Monday. Um, then Stryker calls Punk and Luke Gallows Usos. I don't know if you caught that. The no. Usos meaning brothers. He says this multiple times throughout the evening about different teams. Uh, Todd Grisham says that our truth is addicted to winning, which 
I feel really <laughs> bad for him because he's addicted yeah. to something he very rarely experiences, which has got to be frustrating. Then, as that reverse tree slam that you mentioned is hit, is hit, Stryker yells out of nowhere, could it be addiction or recovery? What, what does that actually mean? That's followed up, though, after this match, as they talk about Extreme Rules, TLC, whatever this is, they talk, and this is a tagline that is used multiple multiple times throughout the evening. I guess it's like the most stupendous WrestleMania ever. They, they refer to this upcoming pay-per-view as, direct quote, the most aggressively entertaining concept in WWE history. Aggressively entertaining concept? What? Yes, nobody nobody speaks like that. No um, human being or even well-programmed android would speak that way. Your general manager of SmackDown is in the back, Teddy Long. We love Teddy Long here on the program. He's meeting with Vicky Guerrero and Eric somebody. Eric and Escobar, I guess? I had to look this up. I had no idea who this human being was. I was so distracted, though, by Vicky's horrible acting. As she yes. shook as she got angry. This was horrendous WWE backstage television. Yeah, Vicky says, you're wrestling Chris Jericho, says to get out and just yells a bunch. And it was, uh, uh, it, it was not good. Um, it would seem like an Academy Award winner, though, compared to the next backstage segment. Oh, my God. <laughs> this... I, I do not know how to describe how terribly stilted Kane's counterpart was, which I eventually Mike learned. Mike Knox. <laughs> this is the same Mike Knox from ECW? From WWE's ECW, yes. Oh, my God. I I do not remember Mike Knox looking like... A Viking uh, Raider? <laughs> he's looking like a Viking Raider, or to me, he looks like if every gym in America closed and Braun Strowman was still alive. That's what Braun Strowman would look like. This backstage promo where there's some, first there's like some wacky music playing. It's all dark and dim, but in like an overly produced style. Kane walks into some guy who we later learn is Mike Knox. This guy cuts the most bland, stilted promo telling Kane of all people, direct quote, fighting you was a worthwhile experience. And I'd like to do it again. This guy, again, 6'5", 300 pounds, unkempt, long hair and beard. And he says, fighting you was a worthwhile experience. And I'd like to do it again. And he says this to Kane. And then Kane just agrees and says, yes, I enjoyed it as well. Yeah, and then he starts, yeah. Knox starts talking about asphyxiation can cause extreme euphoria throughout the entire body. And all I'm thinking is this is even creepier than that Snitsky Heidenreich that's, backstage segment. That's exactly what it made me think of. And, and that's exactly what they were going for. They wanted it to be a creepy thing where Mike Knox is into getting beat up by Kane. So, but he's so bad at delivering his lines. Yeah. The, the whole thing was terrible. It reminded me of when you watch SNL and it's someone who isn't an actor or a comedian. <laughs> it's like Charles Barkley is the host of SNL and he's doing a sketch and it's just so obvious. He's staring off into the distance, reading these cue cards. It was this level of delivery here from Mike Knox. Eric Escobar, who, like I mentioned, I have zero memory of this guy existing at all. Uh, and then it's because this show took place in December of 2009, he was cut in January of 2010. And when so was he, he hired? November? He was not here very <laughs> long. Yeah. Uh, he's he's taking on one half of the tag team champions in Chris Jericho. We see clips of the big show saving Jericho and destroying DX, the Shawn Michaels and Triple H version. And they're having a TLC match for the tag team titles at the pay-per-view. Um Stryker calls the DX the soldiers of fortune, which what? And then he also says that TLC is again, direct quote, one of the most unnerving and treacherous environments we have ever known. Again, no human being would ever speak this sentence. Escobar with some generic offense until Vicky Guerrero interrupts the match. 
She's screaming her annoying excuse me's, and then she changes it to a handicap match. The Big Show, the other half of the tag team champions, comes out to join the match. Escobar, I did like he quickly tried to pin Jericho before the Big Show could get all the way to the ring. This was awesome. I I don't know if Escobar ever did anything well other than this in his career, but I had the exact same note that the second show comes out as he's slowly coming down the entranceway. Escobar is like, oh, God. I have 25 seconds to get this pin, and he's doing everything in his power to be able to do that. It's also at this point where I noted that I am not 100% convinced that Eric Escobar is not Brent Albright. Jericho destroyed him quickly. He ends up tapping to the walls of Jericho. Jericho cuts a promo after the match saying this Sunday will be the end of DX. They will eradicate them. This was I actually really like this uh Jericho show promo. I thought it was very effective. We should also note quickly that apparently the story with Escobar was that he was pretending to be attracted to Vicky Guerrero and was acting as her boyfriend basically so he could get on to SmackDown. And then once he got there, he would just insult her and call her fat and ugly. And again, just just great television. And I say that with the utmost sarcasm here on this professional wrestling show. Drew McIntyre comes out. Yes, the same Drew McIntyre who is uh, one of the main eventers in WWE in 2022. Uh, He comes out, but man, does he look like a totally different human being with no beard. He's lean. He's uh, looks like a totally different human. The babiest of faces here. This (laughs) is like if an 11 year old could be six foot four and 260 pounds and jacked with long hair. That is what uh, Drew McIntyre looked like here in comparison to look what he looks like now. He also seemed terrified throughout this promo. And and the backdrop for this is that, again, this is early in Drew McIntyre's WWE career, and he has been anointed both on camera and off camera by both Vince and Stephanie McMahon as the future of the company Basically, that the company is going to be built entirely around him, the next world champion. Talk about a lot of pressure for a kid who is extremely young and looks extremely nervous here. They were eventually right. Yes. <laughs> but it was it was 10 years later. A uh, log and, and a winding road that went through many dark buildings that evolved shows and, and yeah. other things before he got there. So he's re- going to wrestle John Morrison for the Intercontinental Championship in a ladder match at TLC. He talks about how Vince declared him the future world champion. He's he's mad that he's not on the cover of a WWE magazine. It's okay, Drew. It's 2009. You don't need to be on the cover of a magazine. <laughs> no. Uh, Drew beat Morrison last week after running his head into the apron. Um so why is Morrison getting? Why are they doing this match again? <laughs> was, that was not a title match. So, uh, so this will be for the title at the pay per view. Um, okay, so he earned the title shot. This promo was missing intensity or conviction or something. Something was missing. Everything sure. was missing. This was this was a guy reading lines it wasn't as bad as mike and ox but this was a guy reading lines that were written for him by people who knew he's nothing about promo, him he's a great promo today yeah. and and here it it's night and day with the lack of intensity uh you can tell he didn't believe what it. you're saying yeah. yeah he didn't feel it he didn't believe it you can tell that not one of the 40 writers on the team came to him and said hey here's what we, here's what we want you to get across how would you say this how would you express this None of this. It's a guy reading lines. Morrison came out dressed as Braveheart. Oh, God. He was not happy about this. Morrison does a terrible Scottish accent. This was not good, and it went on way too long. My notes just say, oh, my God, end, please. (laughs) Yeah, This went on for so long. It was terrible. Like you said, it went on forever. It it, it was – the only way I'm going to say it's similar in that It was like the opening promo with Batista in that they could have accomplished what they were trying to accomplish in three minutes instead of 15. The difference was that Batista's delivery was at least good enough that it kept you engaged throughout. This was two guys doing horrible scripted comedy or scripted promos 
Neither of them were convincing. Neither of them were connecting, and it would not end. It made me want to see the match less than I did going into it, which is the exact opposite of what any wrestling promo should ever do. What would it? I I got shook back into it because I had kind of like zoned out for a second there. I got shook <laughs> back into it because Morrison's bleeding from the eyebrow. Yeah, and I'm what like, was that? He accidentally cut himself with a. He had a sword <laughs> in his Braveheart gimmick. Yes, like, he's all dressed in this costume like Braveheart with a legit sword, and he cut himself with a legit sword. I wonder if that's the sword that uh, Drew McIntyre now pulls out of the entrance. So I wonder if it still has a little bit of John Morrison's blood on it. Yeah, he accidentally cut himself with his own sword. It's amazing that with a promo that's so plastic and fake sounding that they use a non-gimmicked real giant sword. Yeah. So weird. Also weird, Matt Stryker at the end of this promo saying, for the first time ever, the Intercontinental title will be on the line. And I know he was trying to get across that it'll be the first time he was defending against McIntyre, yes. but the way he said it, it came off like he's trying to say that this is the first intercontinental title defense. This was so bad. Yeah, no, I, I, exactly. Like, like the Phantom Tournament happened in Rio de Janeiro, <laughs> and then 25 years later, the first event happened. We get a video package recapping uh, Batista destroying Rey Mysterio. I thought this video package... Now, I, I preface it by saying... 99 times out of 100, I think WWE knocks it out of the park with video packages. Yeah. I right. thought this sucked. It was so overly melodramatic for the level of attack that happened. And I know that's a lot of times what they go for in these. But to me, it just didn't land. And I was just like, they're, they're just trying too hard. Because what it was missing was more of the backstory yes. of why this was such a melodramatic beatdown it's because they were former tag team champions they were best friends and they were doing like they they had this run as like and and, and he turned on him and mm -hmm. this is uh, supposed to be they but for if you're just parachuting in like we are here uh it, it's not a it's not a good enough recap to to warrant uh, uh the trying to sell how dramatic this beatdown was and they usually do such a great job of laying out everything that would make it and your announcers aren't going to do it no no todd grisham is not going to get this emotion over and lord knows what weird words and phrases matt striker is going to use or if he's going to compare you know batista to mr hughes or something kane versus mike knox uh big guys hammering each other in slow boring fashion and i love a lot of big guy matches. I like big guys hitting each other, but this was slow and lame. And Didn't the commentary men... was unbearable during this match. Did these two men wrestle each other on that ECW December to Dismember pay per view or something that we watched? Remember that Kane was coughing was, up blood that had after to be the match? No, that was no, yeah. same guy, but yeah, same no, yeah. <laughs> might as well be the same guy. Uh, Mike Knox made Snitsky look like uh, a great big man here. The commentary, to your point, was horrendous. At one point, Matt Stryker says, the quiet brilliance of Mike Knox, a master of kinesiology. No. No, he's wrong on all of the points he, <laughs> he just made. And 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 using the – not good. The match Maybe wouldn't of, end. Of might have been the only appropriately used word here <laughs> yes. because quiet, no. Brilliance, no. I guess Mike Knox is, is his name. That's master, right. <laughs> absolutely not kinesiology i'm not seeing much of that going on here either kane with a choke slam of finally wins this match it, oh this was too long and brutal we then get a dx christmas commercial what was this they are selling some of the most hideous dx merchandise i've ever seen so it's a horrible shirt it's a it, it's horrible everything and then hornswoggle pops out of a box to show off a DX t-shirt and Hornswoggle t-shirt. So horrible t-shirts all around. Swoggle tries to steal Sean's hat off the top of the tree and the tree falls onto Triple H and Shawn Michaels and Swoggle puts on the hat, throws on some, some crotch chops and, and leaves. The... 
I was still just horrified at, at they were that someone was going to buy that merchandise. Where could you wear <laughs> yes. that DX shirt to? Those shirts were horrible. Like even at a wrestling show, which no. there are worse. There, there are. There's no worse fashion that you will ever see in your life than at a professional wrestling show. Even among wrestling shirts, other wrestling fans would be like, "What are you doing?" Yeah, no. terrible shirt. Mickey James and Maria taking on the women's champion Michelle McCool and her partner Layla. Lay cool. They come out wearing Piggy James shirts. Um, Mickey James versus Michelle McCool is the women's title match at TLC. And this was a reminder that women's wrestling has uh, come a long way as we watch it in 2022. The presentation uh, of it in WWE the, the, has come light years from where it was at this point. Also, this is another in that long lineage of like you think back to the way they would talk about molly holly on yeah. air and then here with the piggy james these are people who for one who cares but like these are people who are the furthest thing from obese right. that you would ever see on a pro wrestling show and the way the announcers or the way they talk about them it's like they're like bastion booger out there like i, I don't so get weird. it at all no it, it, it's so weird um Mickey sends Layla into McCool, rolls her up. Mickey James gets the pin. At least this was short. Yes, there, uh, there is no more to this. You are not leaving anything out. Uh, this was nothing, unfortunately. We get a commercial where we're told we can download John Cena's ringtone. Do you remember that selling ringtones was big business for a while there. <laughs> well, I want to know, does this mean you could down, you could download John Cena's entrance music as yeah. a ringtone yeah. or could you download whatever it was that is the ringtone on John Cena's personal phone? Maybe that's the variant. Like every 500th person gets the actual ringtone on his phone. But yes, that is a, there's another no way one. that John Cena's theme song wasn't his ringtone. <laughs> that's that, Valid. one and the same. That's Valid a, point. Absolutely true. Just also like it, it was impossible until he became a movie star. It was impossible for me to believe that he went out in public dressed any other way than how he was dressed to wrestle. Um, but yes, we uh, we also have this weird before this. They, they say something up. Batista has a hold harmless agreement. Uh, but Ray has Batista. So they're going to have a street fight tonight, the main event. And somehow Matt Stryker is saying that that means Ray Mysterio has Batista right where he wants him. What? How is, <laughs> how is a street fight stipulation beneficial to Ray Mysterio <laughs> against Batista? Especially considering that we just saw Batista over the course of the previous two weeks murder the Undertaker. <laughs> but Ray Mysterio... <laughs> Holds the advantage under similar rules. Okay. We get a recap of Raw, the Raw rebound. And, man, Raw looks like a significantly better show than I'm getting on SmackDown here. Yes. So, uh, they run down the entire TLC card, uh, which is the WWE title. John Cena defends against Sheamus in a tables match. The tag titles with DX challenging Jericho in a TLC match. The ECW championship is on the line. Christian defends against Shelton Benjamin, uh, ECW uh, uh, native uh, in a ladder <laughs> that, match. That horrible silver ECW title belt that says WWE at the top of it. I also just want to briefly mention in the Raw recap that you talked about, we see Raw guest host Mark Cuban get speared horrifically through a table <laughs> by Sheamus. Oh, my God. Mark Cuban earned his money that evening. Mark Cuban was amazing in this recap from his guest referee spot to everything. Getting revenge on Randy Orton for, like, getting, uh, getting hunted RKO'd. or RKO'd, like, six years prior. By, by guest host standards, he had to have been the best ever. This was great. I, I, oh, I was, uh, yeah, I was so could impressed. He, could he just have bought WWE and become <laughs> the on-screen GM? It would have been better than what we were getting back then. Yeah, that was so great. Uh, and of course, to close out the TLC card, the world title, like we mentioned, Undertaker versus Batista in a chairs match. And that takes us to our main event of SmackDown. Rey Mysterio versus Batista 
in a street fight. And now this is the point where, you know, I, I said the video package didn't do a good job of trying to get over, you know, how uh, the backstory of how we got here with these two. If you listen to Matt Stryker's commentary, he couldn't do it either. No. During this match, you would have thought that Batista and Rey Mysterio were closer friends than Eddie Guerrero and Rey. Like, yeah. It, it was too over the top and too ridiculous and really doing a disservice to actually how good this buildup and, and feud was. Yeah, it fell flat because they didn't show the video, show in the video package the actual relationship they had. And then you had, as you said, Stryker going so over the top and talking about how Ray was distraught and crying because he, Batista wasn't at Thanksgiving with him and all that. Also, also, Stryker at the beginning of this match doubled down on his theory, his supposition that Ray Mysterio has the advantage <laughs> in this street fight. No rules. Anything goes against Batista. This, uh, These guys come out in their gear. So it's not come as you are street fight here. No, no jeans and no uh, uh, knee pads over jeans and cowboy boots cool here. Batista would have looked in that. It come out with sunglasses, but then the knee pad over the jeans, some designer jeans. Uh, opportunity loss opportunity loss so they come out in their gear no pyro for batista anymore because they don't want people cheering him so they're they're really steering into this uh, heel turn here so he comes out with no pyro and it's all batista early in this match he fires ray hard into the buckles oh god all in the ring early for this street fight batista's rubbing the elbow in Ray's face during the cover. Sure seems like Ray has the advantage in this match, Matt Stryker. <laughs> yeah, Batista's doing the Scott Hall slapping the back of Ray's head. <laughs> we should uh, mention the, you talked about the buckle. It's such an effective move for Ray to take visually because his head, like the base of his skull, is exactly the height of the top turnbuckle. So when he gets whipped in, if he goes in hard, it looks so nasty and it looks like it could be a knockout ray hits a chop block a drop kick we get a teased 619 but batista rolls out to the floor batista slides under the rope ray steps over him slides outside batista awesome. goes after him ray out quicks him back into the ring drop kicks him and then batista goes to the barricade and now is down on the outside. This was a uh, a super cool sequence showing the quickness of Ray and uh, out quicking Batista for the advantage. Yeah, they had great chemistry here. You could tell, and Batista was so good, like working with a guy like Ray and giving him so much. In some ways, the interactions between them, particularly that, really reminded me of uh, Eddie Guerrero and Brock Lesnar. Sure. Yeah. After commercial. Batista's in control. We see him bending Ray's back around the ring post. Oh. Ray's in the ring, just bent around the post while Batista's pulling him from the outside. During the commercial, we see a replay where Batista threw Ray into the steps to get the advantage. He's whipping Ray outside the ring with camera cables. Batista drops him across the announce table. This is the first time we're seeing the street fight. Uh, some weapons get involved here. And shockingly, Batista has the advantage when it turns to a street <laughs> fight. Not Rey Mysterio. Rey had the advantage when it was fast-paced actual wrestling. Uh, a couple other announcer notes here because I was locked on at this point. I have too. a clip coming up once we're back in the ring here. Uh, okay. <laughs> but let me let me just mention these and we'll see if this is what you have. This is probably what you have queued up. <laughs> well, first, he says again, he uses this Usos thing where he says that they used to be Usos, Ray and Batista. Then is, is the clip you have about the hard skull. It sure is. <laughs> okay, I will not say it anymore. I assume that's what it was, so I will lay out and let Matt Stryker do his work. It's, yeah, they get uh, uh, they get back inside the ring. Batista uh, puts on a camel clutch, and now we get Stryker. He starts talking about bone protein and milk and how hard it will be <laughs> to concuss 
Batista, let me let Matt Stryker explain. You're always told to drink your milk, right, to build up strong bones because milk has protein in it. Think about it. Batista's protein intake is so much more than the average man. Does that mean, ooh, that Batista's skull is harder than the average man? Would it take more chair shots to perhaps daze or concuss the number one contender? Well, if you're wondering just how devastating a chair can be, check out WWE.com. Insanity. This guy's terrible. <laughs> He's horrible. I have been watching wrestling for <laughs> more than 35 years. I have watched so many different promotions, many of them bad, many of them with horrendous commentary. I have never heard a more ridiculous thing said on a pro wrestling show in my life than this string of sentences that you just heard from Matt Stryker. He just says stuff. He's. It's like if you completely short-circuited Gorilla Monsoon's brain, what Matt Stryker just said is what would come out. Batista brings a chair into the ring. Mysterio fights out of a power bomb, hits a drop toe hold, which sends Batista into the chair. Springboard seated Senton and a drop kick to the back puts Batista in position for the 619, which Mysterio hits. Ray then with a splash off the top rope gets a two count. This near fall was awesome. People were into Ray Mysterio getting it, pulling it upset here. Absolutely. No, this was the best sequence of the match, the best sequence of wrestling we've seen on the show. And unsurprisingly, the crowd reacted. I just want to point out once more, Rey Mysterio with the advantage <laughs> during the wrestling portion of the match, not weapons based, not street fight, using his speed, hitting that springboard, falling splash, as you mentioned, only to crowd going into it. Ray grabs the chair. Uh, he starts hitting Batista with it. And this is where the camera shakes and camera zooms in and out that have become such a wretched hallmark of modern WWE production. They're evident here in full force in 2009. I had to look away from the screen. I'm not saying that to say it. I'm not being ridiculous. Literally, it was giving me motion sickness. I was looking for drama me. He's got the chair over his head, and Batista hits a spear on Mysterio. Spine buster by Batista. Batista hits Mysterio in the head with a chair shot. Brutal, and he gets the pin after the match. Batista goes to pilmanize the neck of Ray. He puts the chair around his neck. He's going to come off the ropes onto it, but the lights go out. The Undertaker's dong hits, and the <laughs> lights come up, and the Undertaker's in the ring, and he beats down Batista. Taker this grabs the chair, and Batista bails out. The intensity from Taker here, not that you would expect anything less, but man, like we think a lot of the low energy stuff here on this show, Undertaker comes out and he is fighting Batista and attacking Batista like it's a guy who beat him within an inch of his life for the two previous weeks. This was great. And Batista, he doesn't get anywhere near as much credit as he deserves as far yeah. as just being effective as a big man, not only as a promo, not only dominating people, but here selling for Taker or in this match selling uh, for Mysterio when the cat and mouse game was on, he was fantastic here. He was so great uh, after standing tall two weeks in a row, uh, beating him down with the chair. As soon as he gets hit with the chair, flailing about, bailing out of the ring as the Undertaker stands tall, uh, the, he was uh, tremendous. Uh, both guys were tremendous in uh, putting over their match for the pay-per-view. This is a totally fine go home show. Like this was uh, this was good. It got across what it needed to get across. This was their big match. The Raw show was trying to get across the DX Jericho TLC match. This one was focused on Undertaker and uh and, and Batista. Uh Raw had the better hand, but uh uh with what SmackDown was pushing, this was uh, a a totally fine go home show. In in the dark match, fun note the Undertaker pinned CM Punk oh, to wow. keep the title in six minutes, 59 seconds, hitting the last ride powerbomb. So. Wow. I would not go anywhere near as far as you and say this was a totally fine go-home show, and I believe you used the word good. Yes. I thought everything involving Batista 
and Rey Mysterio uh, and The Undertaker at the end was awesome. Yeah. Everything else on this show sucked. Yeah. I thought the I, announcing yeah. was putrid. The Kane, Mike and Ox stuff, offensively bad. Uh, the wrestling on this show, almost non-existent. But the, they got over the main event angle very well. And so from that point, it was effective. But to me, I I, I could as not a, use the word good for this show. No, no, no. I, I, it was good as a go-home show. As a overall wrestling television show, no. That was the what you just described as being the good things are the only good things on here. The rest of it was absolutely wretched. Uh, but the way that they divide up the pay-per-view card between Raw and SmackDown, they only had to get over that match and technically the Morrison and uh and Drew McIntyre match. Oh, and they fell they fell disastrously was, there. That was terrible, but it's not the big main event. There's three matches that are selling that show. That's John Cena and Sheamus. Uh that's DX and Jericho uh and Big Show and that's the Undertaker and Batista. So they 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 the focus was in the right place. The rest of the show was horrendous. Uh yeah, but uh, Batista MVP for this show uh absolutely could you imagine if he wasn't on this show no. this would be just a, a, a terrible program but with him on there totally fine go home show or imagine if someone else on this show was in the batista role could you imagine if mike knox was playing <laughs> the role of batista on this show as an example yes i agree to the 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 main event angle was done very well, but I can't say that it was a perfectly fine go-home show. Just for my taste, if one of the matches, one of the five matches they're pushing for the pay-per-view, they made me want to see far less after the go-home angle than going into it with, uh, with Morrison and McIntyre. But to your point, that wasn't the main event thing. They uh, Coming out of this, I did want to see Undertaker and Batista wrestle. I wanted to see... No one else on this show beyond the pay-per-view other than Rey Mysterio. I was desperately hoping that if I tuned into this pay-per-view, I would not hear the voices of Matt Stryker or Todd Grisham. They are undoubtedly, if you're talking about MVPs, the co-LVPs of this show were Todd Grisham and Matt Stryker. And I think, I wouldn't say co, it was Matt Stryker. Grisham is bad, but he's just Todd Grisham. Matt Stryker yeah. actively made me angry and maybe want to turn off the show. So yeah, he so was. Would you say horrendous. worst thing? Are you going to say worst thing on the show? Was it Matt Stryker? Was the worst thing on this show? Kane and Mike Knox. What you have a lot to choose from. What you was do it that long segment between John Morrison and Drew McIntyre. What is the worst thing on this show for you? For me, it's Matt Stryker because all those other things were confined to their segment. When you have a horrible announcer that is an active detriment to the show and you have to hear him for two hours and hear him drag down segments that either are otherwise good or he, or a good analyst or color commentator could make better and instead he makes it worse i, I can't choose anything other than matt striker even though to your point there were several other really bad things on this show yeah, I think we're we're in alignment there. It was just it was not it was relentless. It was a uh, well. How, what did they say? It was it was aggressively bad. Yeah, <laughs> like, I mean, like this a, was not the most aggressively entertaining concept. Yes, it this was, was the most aggressively grating broadcast yes. performance of any announcer I've ever heard. Uh, I felt like it was the most treacherous environment <laughs> I had ever been in as a wrestling fan, having to listen to him for two hours. Favorite thing on this show? Oh, it's it's. Batista, actually, if, if we're going to boil it down to one thing, it's the cat and mouse sequence that you described between yeah. Batista and Rey Mysterio uh, going inside of the ring, outside of the ring. Uh, Rey was great in that, but Batista, his ability to somehow both be dominant and make Rey Mysterio seem like a threat against him with the visual difference between the two men um, was tremendous. Like I said, just uh, a... Pro's pro, a, a great wrestler um, when it comes to what being a big-time American-style pro wrestler on TV is. Batista had it all. Yeah, I, I'm, I, 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 we're in total alignment on this one. Uh, I don't have anything else to add. That's exactly my my favorite. Uh, my, the, you know, the, the match as a whole between uh, Mysterio and Batista, highlighting that point that you you brought out with that that sequence. But uh, the match as a whole was extremely effective. Um, it, yeah, just absolutely the best thing on this show uh, by far. Rey Mysterio uh, 
was still so good in 2009. Uh, totally underrated as a, uh, uh, as, as a baby face. And underutilized. And yes, and he's here yeah, sort of as a, a device in this match uh, with Batista to build to the Undertaker match. But when you think about Rey Mysterio's title reign where they put the title on him, Vince didn't want the title on him. It was maybe the most poorly booked champion uh, as far as a world champion, a WWE champion, a universal champion in the company's history. There's so much more that could have been done with Rey Mysterio and that could still be done right now as we record this with Rey Mysterio than what he has. I mean, he still, he still is great. Yeah, it's it's crazy to think about how, you know, you're watching him in 2009 and you're like, oh man, I, I worry about this guy's knees. These yes. knees are, oh, are these knees shot? And then you, you can turn on the TV in 2022 and he's still flying around and looks great. So it's- Anyone uh, who looks great in 2022 that wrestled on Nitro <laughs> yes. is incredible. It's a short list. There's a few of them out there. Jericho's another one. And my hat's off to anybody that's still able to pull that off some 20, 23, 25 years later. And with that, we're going to call it a podcast. If you want to share your thoughts on this show, interacting with the show is best done through Twitter at Wrestle at Random. The same for Instagram. Uh, DMs are open. Uh, we've also got uh, email, wrestling at random at gmail.com. If uh, you want to support the show, there's a couple ways to do that. The best way to do that is via our Patreon, patreon.com slash wrestling at random, where every single week we bring you a bonus show where we review extra bonus content every single week in the bonus feed. So it's in addition to the free show you get here. Sign up at patreon.com slash wrestling at random. You can also sign up via Apple Podcasts right in your Apple Podcast player by clicking the subscribe button. It unlocks the entire back catalog of all of the extra bonus shows we've done up to this point. And then you continue to get the weekly shows going forward. So make sure you hit uh, hit that uh, patreon.com slash wrestling at random or hit that subscribe button in your Apple Podcasts. And uh, there's other stuff you can check out at the Patreon as well. You can be the randomizer. We call it the intentionalizer. You can choose a show for us to review. All kinds of stuff. T-shirts. All kinds of stuff. You can check it out. I, I, I won't rate it to you. Go look at it. Patreon.com slash wrestling at random. We also have a YouTube channel. You can support us by subscribing to the video version of this podcast as well. Subscribe to the audio one too, but also get the video version of this podcast over at our YouTube channel. Search for Wrestling at Random Podcast on YouTube and you can find it there or you can go to wrestlingatrandom.com for links to everything I just described, every single way to subscribe to the podcast. And wrestling fans, no other wrestling fans, so go ahead and tell them about the show if you can't support us financially. Uh, just spreading the word is uh, is help enough. Absolutely. Uh, you know, maybe Thanksgiving dinner, you and a close friend hanging out. Uh, if you're not on the verge of having a falling out with each other, you could share your love of this podcast. What you actually should do is put the video version of this podcast on at Thanksgiving dinner with you and your friend and all your other wrestling fan friends that your friend's giving. Just watch us talk about wrestling and learn lessons to avoid the same fate as Rey Mysterio and Batista. And with that, we're going to wrap it up. Adam, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Jeremy. This was this was an adventure. I'm excited to do this podcast with you. I'm excited to not have to listen to Todd Grisham and Matt Stryker every week or hopefully any other time here forth, uh, randomizer slash intentionalizer. We've had our fill. Give us a season or two break. I want to thank everyone for listening, and we'll talk to you again next time.